Good evening, everyone. I'm Megan Kaysafer with the New York Times, and I'm so pleased to welcome you to Get With The Times, our live event series for college students. Tonight, award-winning journalist Elaine Welteroth is joining us for a conversation with New York Times gender editor Jessica Bennett. Let's meet our guests. Jessica Bennett is gender editor of the New York Times, working to expand global coverage of women, gender, and society. She is the author of Feminist Fight Club, a survival manual for a sexist workplace, which was published by HarperCollins. Bennett began her career at Newsweek, where she was a senior staff writer and was previously a contributing writer and columnist for the Times style section. She was the first journalist to profile Monica Lewinsky in a decade and has covered campus life issues, female pot entrepreneurs, sexual harassment, and the Me Too movement. Elaine Welteroth is an award-winning journalist, thought leader, and the former editor-in-chief of Teen Vogue. She is the youngest person and the second African-American ever to hold the editor-in-chief title in Condé Nast 107-year history. In this role, she brought social consciousness to the pages of Teen Vogue and transformed the teen title into a credible news source. Previously, she held senior roles on the mastheads at Glamour and Ebony Magazine, and in 2012, she became Condé Nast's first ever African-American beauty director. She's now a leading expert, advocate, and voice for the next generation of change makers, bringing her fresh perspective to scripted and unscripted projects in TV and film. The New York Times would like to thank our sponsor, The North Face, and our media sponsor, Refinery29, and the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism for making this program possible. We're delighted to share that the New York Times is streaming this event to students who are hosting watch parties on college campuses across the country. You'll hear from some of them later this evening. Please join me in welcoming Jessica Bennett and Elaine Welteroth. Thank you so much for being here. You guys can be interactive. You guys can say hi back <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> um, and Elaine is feeling a little under the weather, so you know, Forgive we me. really appreciate her being here. <laughs> um, so I want to talk a little bit about your path, because I think a lot of people here know that you were at Teen <clears throat> Vogue. But I'm curious how you got there. You were the youngest person ever to be appointed editor-in-chief and the second woman of color at all of Condé Nast in its history. That's pretty remarkable. They don't tell you that when they give you the job, by the way. <laughs> you learn about that part later. <laughs> yeah. Um, my path, oh my gosh. So first of all, I'm so happy to be here with you guys. Thank you for showing up and, and coming out. Um, I apologize in advance that I sound like this. Bear with me. Um, so how did I get there? So I grew up in a small town in California, Northern California, and um, I effectively stalked an editor <laughs> of a magazine who I came across and um, I was incredibly inspired by her and her story. I, I, I read a story that she'd written and something told me to Google her. Um, and I read her bio and it just completely cemented um, the dream that I had, my, the career, the professional dream that I had for myself. Um, and I just knew I had to meet her. Like it was, ve I was very laser focused. I think some people sort of, um, you know, they they sort of get, you know send out their resumes to everyone. And I think there's different ways, for, different approaches for different people. But for me, it was really about meeting this woman who really inspired me. Her name was Harriet Cole, um, and I stalked her relentlessly. I sent her letters. Before internet, like was this? This was this was, this was like, <laughs> I'm like this is back when there were dinosaurs. No, I I did snail mail her. Okay. And I also um, found her assistant's email, emailed her assistant, called her assistant consistently. This is good advice, by the way. Is it for good? Like a, I don't know. I mean, for better or for worse. creepy, also really good, right. especially for a journalist. Right. I did my homework. You I investigated. Yes, I was fully reporting the situation. Um, I really, really, really wanted to meet her. And so I just made myself available. I said I, I would fly to New York even if I could just bring her coffee for 15 minutes. And I found out later that the assistant was like, this girl's insane. We cannot let her fly to New York 
So just take this call, and then the girl will leave us alone. She'll stop calling. Um, so I think it was like the, the day before, the day after I graduated from college, I got the call with her. And it was this 15-minute call that turned into 45 minutes. And um, I, there was so much synergy. And at the end of the phone call, I said, if there's ever an opportunity to work with you, please keep me in mind. I hung up. I was like, she'll never think of me again. And that's totally OK. Um, I did my part, and now I'm on fire. I know exactly what I want to do. I want to work in a magazine in New York, um, which felt like a very lofty dream for someone like me, coming from where I came from. I was the first person in my family to go to college. Um, and there weren't a lot of people that I grew up with that were sort of dreaming big or even uh, you know, imagining themselves living in New York City. So um, I didn't have a whole lot of role models around me um, to follow, but I found this woman and she became my role model and um, you just could not stop me. I created an A through Z pl game plan on how I was going to get to New York and into a magazine. And so I, I ended up, um, my plan A, I, was, I really at the time wanted to work at Essence. And so I, I, I sent them a video of myself, in addition to the application, a video, which mm -hmm. I found recently when I was moving in. It's so embarrassing. Oh my god! Like India Ari is playing in the background. There's like <laughs> broken blinds. And I'm just like, I'm the one for the job. I'm like so overzealous. And then I made my, I made my own magazine <clears throat> in addition to the application and sent to them. And I, told, I remember saying in my interview, if you just let me be even the, the janitor, I will be happy with that, and one day I will be the editor in chief. Mark my words. Wow! <laughs> Don't do this, guys. By the way, <laughs> it worked. Though. I did get the internship. So, 30 day, I was 30 days away from moving to New York uh, for my big dream uh, to work at Ab Essence Magazine, and then Harriet Cole called me back out of nowhere. This was like four months later, and she said, "I remembered you. I'm looking for an assistant. My assistant's moving to Italy." I remember that you live in California, have a shoot in Malibu. Could you meet me in Malibu on Friday and work as my production assistant for the day? And I'll pay you three fifty dollars for the day. And if things Pretty go good. well, it could result in a job in New York where you're working on all things fashion and beauty um, under me. And I was just like, is this real life? <laughs> is this real life? I truly thought when she called me, I was like, this is a butt dial. I don't even know how she saved my number, let alone how she's accidentally calling me right now, and let alone, and then to come to find out that she was intentionally calling me to give me an right. opportunity. It was like the skies had parted, and I just was in heaven, and I went to the shoot. Um, she didn't tell me it was a cover shoot with Serena Williams. And, Not a bad um, first. Not a bad gig. first gig. <laughs> I really felt like the Black Lauren Conrad. Uh -huh. <laughs> it was really great. And um, by the end of the shoot, she's like, when are you moving to New York? Like, come on. And I'm like, I already have another internship. So you quit oh, the no. first internship. I, I had to quit my, the internship that I, where I told them they, should, they could just give you me the janitor anything. job. Yeah. I'd do anything for them. And they're like, really? Are you, now you're going to give it up? But it was the right move. Um, and I learned so much. I, so I started my career at Ebony Magazine, which was not the sexy choice by any stretch of the imagination at that time. Everyone was like, why would you work there? I, I, but I was very clear that, first of all, what Ebony meant in the black community, um, but also what Harriet Cole could mean in terms of having a daily mentor. Mm -hmm. um, I just knew that I would grow leaps and bounds by taking this opportunity, buckling down, <clears throat> kind of you know, becoming very tunnel vision, uh, tunnel vision, and not listening to the naysayers or the haters, um, because I knew that it was the right opportunity for me. And I, so I started my career there, and I ended up starting the <clears throat> beauty and style department at a very young age because s simply it was a smaller team, mm -hmm. and there was no one there to do it. They were working with a freelancer before that, and. She wasn't present, so I was like, yes. I was the girl who just said yes to everything. Mm -hmm. Just said yes to every single thing. And um, I actually changed my title in my signature to production assistant like four months in. <laughs> also don't recommend that, but did that. And then they started calling me production assistant, and I was making the call sheet, so who's going to tell me I wasn't? Like, you know? Um, really don't recommend that. But um, <laughs> eventually they caught on, and they were like, well, you kind of are the production assistant now. So, so we'll give you the title? title. That's how I got my first promotion. Um, <laughs> I basically gave it to myself. Um, and so, yeah, I worked there for about, I think, four years, which felt like eternity. And I worked through the recession when everyone was losing their jobs, particularly in media. Um, it was a very uncertain time. I, I ate 
peanut butter, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches all day. Just I had a stack in the morning and I would just eat them down and then that was how I survived. Um, and eventually I got the job at Glamour as um, the beauty editor and uh, was promoted about seven months later to senior beauty editor. And then I got the call from uh, Teen Vogue to come and be the beauty director there. And from there became the editor and the rest is history. And so that was ten, ten years ago was when all that first... June 1 will be ten years from when wow. I landed in New York City. Yeah. So you're a New Yorker now. So I'm officially a New Yorker now. <laughs> Congratulations. So I'm to say. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, well, Teen Vogue hugely changed under your watch. <clears throat> you know, I grew up reading Sassy. And Jasmine Hughes, who's one of our reporters who profiled you for the New York Times Magazine, talked about how... She had never really seen a woman of color on the cover of a teen magazine mm. growing up until you took over the helm mm. at Teen Vogue. Mm. And you put Willow Smith on the cover, you put Yara Shahidi on the cover. Was that always part of the plan to better represent reality on mm. the pages of the magazine? Well, <clears throat> so it actually didn't start with Willow and it didn't start with my appointment. We had been working towards, you know, making sure that our coverage was much more diverse um, for a while. I mean, that prior to my appointment, there was a cover that we did in August in 2015, I think. Fact check me, because Trump has thrown me off in terms of Sorry, time. Life yeah, is confusing. life is completely, <laughs> anyway. Um, and we've like tipped off our axes and I'm just like, what day is it? What year? <laughs> I don't know. Um, but we did a cover that sort of defied all of the traditional rules of um, magazine journalism. And uh, at the time, I was working with a really talented creative director. Her name is Marie Souter. And she she's French, and, and she's been in the business a long time. And she was like, there are three things that they have always said to never do, um, or three, three things that will ensure that your magazine will not sell. Uh, put a no-name model on the cover. <clears throat> uh, or, or a model on the cover, a no-name model, and black girl. We did all three on one cover, and um, we it was it was this moment where we we just we knew that these were the three girls that did represent the future of fashion, um, and it was Lanessi Montero, uh, Aya Jones, and uh, Iman Hamam. And they just so happened to be all beautiful women of color. And there was no reason to not do it. Regardless of what we had been ingrained to think, we knew that these were the girls who deserved that cover. And so we, we, we put them on the cover. And at that time, Amy Astley was the editor in chief. And she was one of the most open-minded um, editors I'd, I'd had. And she <clears throat> was very inclusive. And, and, it, and it, was, it was sort of an intentional statement, you know? Um, and, when that cover hit, we got a ton of press around it. And it was, it was interesting because it took bucking the system and sort of um, challenging the status quo to start a conversation about diversity in fashion. And, but, it, but to me, what, as time went on, it, it's, not enough, it's not enough to put brown girls on a cover and think that you've done your job. Um, it, for me, it's always been much more about being inclusive 360. So it's actually rather easy, especially right now. I mean, really, black culture has set the agenda for American culture for so long. So it's, it's, it's not hard to find a talented, beautiful black person or Muslim person or queer person to put on a, the cover of a magazine. What's harder is to practice what you preach and to make sure that the staff reflects the diversity that you're projecting on that cover. And that's always been really important to me. I think the authenticity of the diversity that you're seeing in media is what is, has been the type of, that's been, that keeps me up at night. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and in fact, I think it's more important. Um, I think it's easy to placate diversity, especially mm -hmm. at, at times like this. I think it's really, it's the, almost just the smart thing to do if you're mm -hmm. trying to sell a magazine. And um, so we have to be really careful and thoughtful about how we are getting into this game of, of um, diversity in fashion and diversity in media and, um, and playing in those waters. So, so all that being said, I, I was one of the only, I was maybe the only 
black woman on the team um, on the editorial side at that time. But as you know, things started to move very quickly into the direction of sort of getting handed the, the reins mm -hmm. of Teen Vogue, um, I, I knew that I was being given a, a responsibility that had not been given to anyone who ever looked like me before. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew growing up what it felt like to not see myself in, in, uh, cel in, in ways that were celebrated by the media. I always, I saw black girls as marginalized figures and they were always pushed to the, to the sides. And um, you know, when you watch like the Barbie commercial, you see like the main Barbie who's blonde and then right. you see like her black the friend sidekick. and her, yeah, her, her Latina friend and they're like in the background. And I never felt growing up that like, I didn't, I, I, it messed with me. I remember not wanting the black doll when my mom gave it to me. I was like, I want the real doll. And that, so it reinforced just the power of media and the power mm -hmm. of representation in media. And, and I realized that when I was given this opportunity to do things differently, there was, it came with huge, huge social responsibility and an opportunity mm -hmm. um, to hopefully change things for the better for a girl who looks like me, uh, who is growing up in, in today, and so, <clears throat> or then. And so um, I remember the first cover that, that I felt really, really strongly about was a manless Stenberg, mm -hmm. um, putting her on the cover with her natural afro, mm -hmm. um, putting her in conversation with Solange Knowles, and really letting them have an unmitigated conversation about what black girl magic really means. Um, it's been, it's become this like commercialized hashtag, but what does it mean to two girls who represent that? And, mm -hmm. and, and they talked about black hair and they talked about um, social justice and they talked about just how they're, they're intimately bonded as black women. And I just, when I read that manuscript, I, I just knew that from that day forward, my job had changed. And I was leaning into my purpose in the space I was given in media um, in a way that I hadn't before. And, uh, and it, was, it was like the beginning of the best days of my career. Mm -hmm. I remember getting chills. I cried at my desk. And I just knew that this was going to reach people. And it wasn't just that cover story. Like cover to cover, that issue was, was sort of the first time that we, we, we had it all come together and said, we need to do things differently. We need to dig deeper. There's so much opportunity to mean more to this audience. And, um, and that was just one example. So yeah, so that long-winded way of saying, yes, it was a part of mm -hmm. um, the agenda, but I think only because it's authentically who I am and um, it's part of the community that I represent. And I think as a magazine editor, or as somebody who works in media in a leadership ca capacity, I think your responsibility is to make sure that there is someone on the masthead that represents every different kind mm -hmm. of person. Um, and that was something that I was very diligent about, um, making sure that our, that our staff reflected the diversity that we see in our world. Um, because from there, that authentic storytelling will come. So you can't just change the image or the stories. You have to change the storytellers. Mm -hmm. In that way, do you see your activism and storytelling kind of intertwined? I would say so, absolutely. Yeah, I think as journalists and as storytellers, you have the power to set the cultural agenda. And so y your job is to tell the truth. Your job is to lay out the facts. But it's also your job to determine and discern what is newsworthy. Mm -hmm. And what you get when you have diverse um, you know, players at the table are different priorities emerging that may not have been represented before. And I think that's the beauty. That's the beauty of a newsroom. Like That's mm -hmm. the beauty of working in media. Mm -hmm. um, I know I've grown. I grew so much. Um, just from learning from the people on my team and becoming sensitive to issues that don't necessarily affect me. Um, and I think especially at a time like this, it's, it's our responsibility to do that. So you're no longer a Teen Vogue, but you're doing a lot of cool things. Um, you've been in Blackish, you're writing for Grownish. Um, you were just part of a documentary team <coughs> that followed some of the Parkland survivors. Mm. How do you choose your projects now that you're sort of like free of the man, so yes. to speak, and is that is that liberating? Do you like that? I always say people are like you look, you, it's like you have a glow about you. I'm like, 
liberation. <laughs> I'm on my liberation movement right now. Um, no, not that I didn't feel liberated there. I, I just felt like um, my job was, my, my mission was accomplished. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm really excited by the freedom of being able to um, invest my time and energy and resources um, into projects that feel impactful for young people um, and for young marginalized people. Um, I'm. I think as opportunities come and as I seek out opportunities, I, I always think to myself, um, like, how would this make life better for young me? And I and there are so many young people that I relate to that follow me on social media or that I meet um, out in the world, and I have so many frames of references for people who, who urgently need um, representation. They need their stories amplified. Um, they need to be inspired. I think sometimes activism is just being authentically who you are in public, in spaces where someone like you maybe never existed. And I think um, I, I, that's why I was inspired by Harriet. I had never met any, I had never seen anyone like her in that space, creating space for those kinds of messages. And it lit me up. It literally gave me a sense of purpose at a time when I felt I was searching for it. And the idea that that I have some amount of visibility to hopefully help someone else see what their potential, what their possibilities could be, is the thing that lights me up still to this day. Um, and so I'm very protective and careful about the things that I do um, because it all it all matters. It all matters, and I think every every bit of work um, needs to, especially when you're you're sort of in charge of your own destiny. It, you have to have a very clear North Star. And um, my North Star is really about making sure that I am representing for um, people like me and that, that I'm also helping to create um, possibilities for, for young people and, again, young people who feel marginalized or who have felt othered. Are you still in touch with Harriet? I love, yes, yes, I'm still Is she still there. a mentor? She, yeah, she's like, my, she's like my fashion fairy godmother, that's what I call her. That's amazing. Yeah. So we are going to go to a quick video, and then we're going to turn to questions from some of the students in our audience. Amy Poe speak at the White House Her words hit me hard like a light bulb Take to shoot stuff fictions that girls must die out If we wanna live in a world that triumphs I am just talking about loving the film I ain't talking about nobody else I'm just talking about loving ourselves We love our sponsors, they made this possible <laughs> um, we are going to go to questions. Uh, over here we have Ola from CUNY Journalism School. Hi. Um, Hi. My question is, what advice do you have for young women, especially those of color, looking to break into the industry? How do you stand out among your peers? Well, I think that um, being yourself, is you're going to stand out. You actually cannot help but stand out. So I think embracing that, leaning into that, <clears throat> and not trying to conform. Um, is probably your, that, that, will, that will set you ahead of your peers. I think I spent a lot of time in my career trying to conform um, for the sake of credibility, and I don't think that I actually um, reached my potential until I shed that, uh, that weight or that, I, I, and, and no one tells you to do that. You just sort of, you, it, it becomes a survival tactic that we pick up over time, but I think, um, the idea that you are there because of your unique perspective that no one else can bring should hopefully help empower you to be your full self when you come into interviews and when you're, if you have the opportunity to be at the table to speak up. Um, I think there is such an opening right now um, for young people with, with important perspectives to share, young people of color, women, 
um, to speak up. And I mean, I, if I could choose any time to be young and alive, it would be now. <laughs> it would be now. Like this is your this is your moment. So hopefully that's helpful to you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think that on a video somewhere, we're going to see a person who has a question. I hope. If not, we'll go back to IRL. Hi, Elaine. I'm Elizabeth from Fordham University, and I have a question about your time at Teen Vogue. I was wondering how you chose content that expressed how you felt, yet still remained unbiased. Thanks. Her. <laughs> She's so cute. Um, well, I would say, um, one one of our <clears throat> well, how we approach you know controversial issues we, we tended to hand the microphone over to young people and allow their voice to be amplified so um, we usually uh, found somebody who was experiencing whatever the issue was and we allowed them to speak in first person um, and we found that to be powerful because it was a way to um, typically unlock the humanity in a situation that can otherwise be sterilized mm -hmm. um, in traditional reporting. Um, and when you hear, there's nothing more powerful than hearing from a young person who is living a reality that you may not identify with until you hear their voice and you realize how much you have in common with them. Um, so, you know, whether it was like, you know, uh, I remember we, we got a Syrian refugee to, to speak with us about her experience, um, and 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 because it's in her voice, you I, you realize she's 18. I'm 18. She's going through her first love. I'm I'm going through my first love, and she had to leave her home. She has two sisters. Oh my God, I, I could not imagine having to rescue my two sisters and and go through these harrowing events in, at this stage in my life. And I think it just for us, it was a way of opening up the empathy and creating compassion and understanding around these huge global issues that may have felt um, really separate from from you and your day-to-day -day experience so um, that was that was a, a tactic that we employed and that we found um, a lot of success with I also really respect how Teen Vogue has given the microphone over to this group of people that have often been sort of underestimated totally like I'm sure you constantly got asked like well but you're doing serious content, like oh my God, young wet teenage girls <laughs> like politics too, mm -hmm. and I'm sure you have sort of a go-to response well, to that. Well, I would or just be like, did. have you ever met a young girl? Right. <laughs> have you ever talked to her? Because this is not unique. I mean, and also this kind of reporting goes back to the days of Miss Magazine, which right. Gloria Mag and Gloria Steinem was the editor in chief of. <clears throat> excuse me. Glamour has always talked about, you know, global issues, feminism, hand in hand with fashion and beauty. Mm -hmm. But I think that the way. At, the way Teen Vogue did it at the time that we did it um, just somehow pierced the zeitgeist in a way that got the attention of old, older white men. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and suddenly they're like, wow, young people are really, they're really something. <laughs> wow. And I'm just like, yeah, do you have a daughter? Have you ever talked to her about right. anything happening in the news cycle? You probably should. So, you know, I, I think it's, and it's now, it's, I think now we're living in a time where this is almost like the second coming of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And it's really, in many ways, being led by young people. And I think that Teen Vogue just saw that happening and, and allowed those voices to be heard in a way that they hadn't been heard on, in, in mass media. Um, and now it's sort of the rest of the world, it's like the veil has lifted. Yeah. Um, and, and thank God it has. Um, but it's no, it was no mystery to us. Um, yeah, I mean, I think any woman, any young person contains multitudes. And so the idea that you might want to talk about Black Lives Matter and like Bronzer and Bieber <laughs> within one you know, hour, you. It, it's kind of, it, if you know any woman, if you know any young person, that is what, that's just who we are, right? Mm -hmm. No shade if you don't yourself like Bieber. To Hello, my name is Keidra Manns. I'm a student at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. You spoke about mentorship. I wanted to ask, can you give some advice on the best way to get a mentor today? Mm. <clears throat> mentorship is so tricky because that word comes with a lot of weight and responsibility. And when busy people hear that, I think they shy away from it. But Ava DuVernay said this um, when I asked her a question about mentorship um, at the Teen Vogue Summit. She said, it's really about finding someone who cares, 
who is invested in you. Um, and I think there are a lot of different ways to, to do that. And I also think now with social media, there are different levels to the intimacy that you can have with different types of men mentors. And um, sometimes you just need a lever, a lever puller. Sometimes you just need somebody uh, who will make a specific tangible action possible. Like, can you please um, write me a letter of recommendation? And then you write it for them and give it to them. And like you, I think as a mentee, it, you actually should assume a lot of responsibility, um, not only in seeking out mentors, but in also in cultivating the, the dynamic to make sure that it's, be, it's productive for your purposes. Um, you kind of have to lay out the roadmap. You kind of have to set out your expectations. The burden of following up is probably going to fall on you. Um, and so I think you know, being clear about your role is probably the most important thing. Um, and being clear about what you want out of the relationship. Um, I have mentee, I have a lot of young people in my life, and um, I have two mentees, two or three mentees that I speak with consistently, and it's because we've built a relationship over time. I'm invested, like they're my babies, you know? I, I, and you can't have that with 300 people. So um, I think it's just about being realistic about what someone can give you and, and making it clear to them up front what you'd like. So. Um, but the best way, as always, is to start out is ask for coffee, <laughs> harass for the coffee, you know, and don't take it personal if it takes a few emails to get a response and a few more emails and maybe even a couple months to actually get the date on the calendar. Be persistent um, and then use that time wisely because if you knock someone's socks off in that first 15 minutes, you will become unforgettable. And it is actually quite hard to find good, good people, um, believe it or not, to hire in this industry, especially at a time like this, in the age of social media, where I think everybody assumes it's much easier to get in and to get famous and to get insta-famous. Like, there's, it's kind of hard to find people who have the old school um, grit of, of what it really takes to um, make it in this business. So if you can establish that you are uh, cream of the crop in that first 15 minutes, you will be remembered, you will be um, someone that is referred to, for, to jobs. Um, but you know you have to be consistent. You have to be consistent, stay on their radar, um, and also just be clear about what you'd like. I think just blanket asking someone to be your, your mentor might not be the best approach. I think it might be, hey, here's what I love about your work. Here's what I'd like you to know about my work. And here's a way that, I could, that, that you could potentially be helpful to me. Would you be so kind as to X? <laughs> Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I mean, I would also say, like mentorship has become this buzzword now and everyone thinks that they need a mentor and like right. if you don't have a mentor, you're never gonna succeed. And you can have a group of peer mentors. Like you can form a girl gang in mm -hmm. any job that you're in. And what the research has found is that peer mentorship can actually be as effective as having more of a advisor sponsor type. So like while it is wonderful to have an older mentor is it something that has developed over time. So not everyone's going to immediately have one when you start your first job. So I would say form a squad and you mm -hmm. and you can mentor each other. Thank you. I agree. I love that. We'll go to someone else live. Not live. <laughs> Pre tape. Hi, we're from Together for Ladies of Color at Santa Clara University. And we were wondering how you find support as a woman of color in an industry where you were the minority. Looks so nice though. I know. <laughs> that's from my that's like near my hometown. Um, you guys are watching. Hi. Um, uh, it's basically what you were saying, it peer mentoring. I it's not a term that you know you use with your with your friends in the business, but I think seeking actively seeking out relationships with people who were the only or one of few within their organization has been the life, like the lifeblood of my career behind the scenes. You know, having people who are a part of that squad, or as I call it, my tribe, mm -hmm. that I could really trust and that I could really go to for support um, has been everything. So I think, you know, um, I think back in the day there used to be and I'm sure it exists to some extent this this crabs in the barrel mentality that if if there's one there, there's only room right. for one and I have to secure my spot and I'm not um, like I'm not going to open myself up to another woman or to another woman of color I don't want to be typecast I want 
that those days are over. If you want to survive and thrive, you're you are so you are so much um, you're in such a better position if you have um, strength in numbers and people around you who, who can support you. So so many women in this industry have been that for me. Um, other women of color, Nikki Oganaki, who's the um, she's just got promoted. She's the style director at L.com. Um, Julie Wilson, Shiona Torini, Rajni Jacques, uh, Lynette Nylander. There's so many women of color now who, in one way or another, have sort of, we've all helped each other out. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's crucial. And it's not just based on race or culture either. I think it's just people that you, um, that you feel are like-minded and that understand sort of what your, what your plight is. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Hi ladies, my name's Sarah. I'm from CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. It seems that journalists are facing mounting pressure to build a personality or a brand on social media to stay competitive for jobs. So I'm wondering, should journalists be expected to do this? And how have you made social media work for you? Mm. Oh my god, I want your advice on this too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's so funny. I think of it as an elective, like in college. You have, you have electives that can serve your major, but it's not your major, right? So you can choose to take that elective and use it to your advantage <clears throat> and use it to help serve your greater mission. But to, for anyone who thinks that it just takes that, you will, you will be sorely mistaken. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, would, I would say to anyone who feels like it's pr like a pressure, it's probably not the thing that you should be leaning into because the only way it actually works um, or the only way that I think social media is, is like a successful tool in your career is if it's something that you do authentically, if you're able to show up and be yourself and like have fun with it. It's not supposed to be something that you're overthinking or scrutinizing. It's not supposed to be that. And it never has been that for me personally. I, I, um, but I did see how it became it was actually a way for me to exercise my agency <clears throat> and my voice before I exercised it in my work. Mm -hmm. So while I was like at Glamour and I was very much still like wearing the khakis and <laughs> fitting into the box and like did really- Did you really wear khakis? I did really wear khakis. <laughs> I looked like a newscaster. I was like, I was at 23, I probably looked 35. Um, but when I was in that phase uh, professionally, I found social media to be an outlet where I could really just be more, be myself. And it, it turned out to be, I noticed some of the senior editors and people that I wanted, uh, that I respected, and I wanted them to have some amount of awareness of me at all. Um, mm -hmm. They would follow me on Instagram, and I, and I found that it helped us develop a relationship in real life where they, they're like, oh, that was funny, or that was great, that was smart. And it, it sort of helped me navigate an environment where I actually felt quite isolated and not understood um, or misunderstood, or I just I, I wasn't able to find my sea legs as, as easily. Um, so, <clears throat> and over time, it's sort of become this huge phenomenon, but I can never, I, I, I never want it to become something that, that occupies more space than my work does. Um, so I think you have to check yourself. If you go down that path, you know, use it to your advantage, have fun with it. It's a platform for your message. If you're a journalist, there's nothing better. I, yeah. I, I mean, to put an image with words and to convey a story, I mean, that's what we do every single day. So I mean, growing up as a child, I loved photo albums for the same reason. So for me, I just treat my, you know, my Instagram as a you're digital photo album <laughs> yeah. of my life and the things that inspire me, but it's also a powerful tool to, again, set agendas for people because sometimes people are going to read your Instagram post or your tweet before they're actually going to maybe open up the New York Times. Hopefully, like, in fact, all the, the time. <laughs> <laughs> they're only going right. to read the tweet. <laughs> right, and the tweet and the Instagram post inspire pitches, mm -hmm. right? And they inspire yeah. feature stories and they inspire, they inspire the work that we all do as journalists as well. Yeah. Definitely. What's your, what would you say? What was your answer? What would be your answer to that? I mean, I just think it's an incredibly powerful tour, tool to have your voice heard, especially when you're starting out. Like, mm -hmm. there are just so many more ways to become a writer or a journalist or a storyteller mm -hmm. in one way or another now than there were when I was beginning my career. Like, I was still 
one of those journalism students that was advised to like go move to a small town and work for a newspaper. So was I. And like, thank God I didn't do that. <laughs> I moved to New York and waitressed. Um, <laughs> but I think that, you know, you can find your voice and other people can find your voice online in a way that they simply couldn't in the past. Like it's sort of yep. democratized media in a way. We can all have a voice and a platform now. Yep. Um, we are going to Sarah at UC Irvine. Hi, my name is Sarah Lee and I go to UCI. And um, the question I had was, what advice do you have for students who are still trying to figure out what they want to pursue in the future? That's the most important question of life. <laughs> <laughs> and you will ask it again and again. Um, I, I always say that the universe or the world doesn't prepare young people for real world, the real world and for how to, how to answer that question. Um, but the way I found the answer to that question for me was just mining my everyday life and mining my own childhood for the things that gave me life, the things that gave me joy, the things that I was already doing for free. <clears throat> and, and within that, I found professional purpose. You know, like I, I mentioned, I was doing those photo albums. I was obsessed mm -hmm. with my photo albums from a very young age. And I took it for granted. I just thought everyone loves photo albums. And no, no, they don't. Not as much as I did. <laughs> those were my magazines. And yeah. when I when I went back, when I kind of did soul, some soul searching towards the end of college, when I had an existential crisis <laughs> over which that is very okay, question, also, which is, yeah, honestly, to be expected, I wish someone told me that senior year is the scariest year you'll probably face, and, and no one told me that. And um, hopefully it's not for everyone, but I'm gonna say that for shock value so that it, <laughs> you can't say no one told you. Um, um, I was really freaked out, and I wanted to be great. I wanted a big life, but I didn't know what that actually meant. I didn't know how to achieve it. And so um, once I, I kind of did the soul searching and, and, and looked into my, my, my own day to day and my own life and my childhood, I realized there, was, there were themes that emerged. And I wanted to get paid to do the things that I loved doing for free. And the things I loved doing for free was like interviewing people essentially. Like mm -hmm. I was always like in the party with a person mm -hmm. in the corner, like getting their whole life story. Um, and I wanted to do that for a living. And I, I was like either gonna be a therapist or a journalist. And I was like, <laughs> they don't care about style and therapy. So I guess I'll go this way. Um, <clears throat> but um, it's always there. And I think that's a more reassuring thought. I think when people ask you like, what's your passion? Mm -hmm. Or what do you wanna be when you grow up? It's daunting because a, that's a lot of pressure. Um, but if you, if you ask someone instead a different question, what do you what do you do what do you do for free that you love mm -hmm. or like what what lights you up what is a lot when's the last time you felt totally free totally alive and then start that kind of dialogue with yourself you realize that the answers are actually already there you just have to kind of you have to listen to and look for them that's really good advice hi hi um, my name is Natsanet Neguse and I'm a student at CUNY Graduate School of Journalism you need representing. I know, I know. right? <laughs> um, my question for you is, back in 2015, you spoke with activist supermodel Bethann Hardison about the future of fashion as part of her Balanced Diversity Initiative. In your interview, you highlighted the need for structural changes in the field of journalism and expressed the importance of mentorship to build a pipeline for the next generation of leaders. Mentoring differs from one individual to the next, how do you define mentorship and how effective do you think it needs to be in order to see long lasting representation in positions of power? Ooh. <clears throat> so we talked about some of this already. So the mentoring aspect um, is key. I think having someone who can be your advocate is internally is also really, really important, um, especially for people who have felt othered within an organization who are feel or who feel um, isolated to any extent. I think, um, let's see, what was the last part of that question? I want to make sure I, I distill it. Yeah. Um, how effective do you think mentorship needs to oh, be in to order to see long-lasting leadership changes? I mean, I'll jump in for a second. Yeah, I think please. that like, what we know is that women and people of color are less likely to be mentored. Mm -hmm. And we also know that it is primarily white men who still remain in power. So like, there's a connection there. And I really do think mentorship is key. 
we were talking about how you can have peer mentors, like that can be just as effective. But having people around you to support you, and especially you mentioned the pipeline, like moving up the corporate ladder, it's incredibly important. And there are some institutions that have, have taken strides to actually create mandatory mentorship programs because they know that it's happening less. Mm -hmm. um, and so we need to solve for that. And I think especially now, in this moment that we're in, post Me Too, or in the middle of Me Too, when men are feeling uncomfortable at work, nobody's quite sure how to interact, like it's really awkward in a lot of ways, and we already know what research has found is that men are less likely to mentor women because they're worried it will be taken the wrong way by mm -hmm. other peers. Like, yeah, mandatory mentorship, <laughs> why not? Mm -hmm. so, so that's my two cents on mentorship. Yeah, no, I, I agree with everything you just said, and I, I do think the pipeline issue is, um, it's, a, it's something you have to address at different levels, at different mm -hmm. stages. So um, yes, once they're in the system, then we do need sometimes to set up mandatory mentorship opportunities, but how do we even get them there? Mm -hmm. And I think having more a more inclusive work environment will only breed a more inclusive work environment. We know that research also shows that we hire people who look like us, who we relate to. And so that's how you get into this scenario where you have an echo chamber or you have you have a you have an office environment that only reflects one kind of person. Um, so we have to be really intentional about breaking through our own bias and seeing beyond beyond our bias and and making sure that we're creating an intentionally inclusive environment because it's not going to happen any other way. You know, it, it just isn't. And I don't think it's necessarily about setting quotas, but I think it's about creating a responsibility. Everyone should feel a part of this responsibility. Um, I think if you're looking at a, a, a job pool that is only one kind of person, you just have to, you have to force yourself to go beyond that. Um, <clears throat> and the work always benefits from it, is what I have found consistently in my career. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, p creating a pipeline is the first thing. It's like, how do we get someone in the door who, had, who, would, who would otherwise not be here? And then how do we create a, a culture of responsibility where everyone feels it's their job to make sure that everyone feels safe in, in that environment, emotionally safe, um, and in every other way. Uh, and then, yeah, in, in terms of oper operationalizing it and creating systems within that structure so that people can grow and thrive in those environments because just sometimes just getting them in the door is not enough. There are plenty of companies that see mm -hmm. people come in and out because it's just the culture hasn't hasn't evolved to support the diverse, the diverse culture, um, or sorry, the culture hasn't evolved to support the diversity of the people that are now coming into the mm -hmm. system. So it's, it's multi-pronged. For anybody who thinks that the diversity inclusion issue at, in corporations is an easy thing to solve, it's not. It's, yeah, it's multi-pronged. Hopefully some of you but in the you room all, will help yeah, solve exactly. it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You all are the future. <laughs> We're going to do one more. Um, this is from Elsa at the University of San Diego. <clears throat> Hi, Elaine. My name is Elsa. I'm with the University of San Diego. And my question for you is, how can we as students bring more social consciousness to journalism? I just thought that there's the West Coast is represented here. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, how can we bring more, more social consciousness to journalism? Um, by bringing your social consciousness into the work that you do every day. And I think, again, as I said earlier, there's an opening right now for it. I think that we are more awake than we've ever been to our own blind spots and biases. And I think um, it's really up to young people to come in with those fresh perspectives and to, and to push the older folks um, out of the, the status quo, just thinking a certain way and operating a certain way, um, and pitch. Like, mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times I've been inspired by pitches that have come in, even on Twitter, mm -hmm. um, or in my DMs from young people with a really fresh perspective about issues happening, issues that we are facing our world today. So um, I think it's really just about staying informed, read everything, and then not being afraid when you get the opportunity to share your perspective. What, what would you say to that? 
Yeah, I think that you know mm -hmm. newsrooms are changing. Mm -hmm. um, you don't even necessarily need to be in a newsroom to bring social consciousness to journalism these days. True. Like more people can be journalists, um, and you know Gloria Steinem said the other day that she's never seen this much activism in her lifetime. Mm -hmm. Like you are the generation that is leading this. So. And also, you are. To your point, regardless of whether you hold a post um, at a formal journalism, you know, if you, if you're, regardless of whether you're a formal journalist or not, mm -hmm. you are in a position to hold journalists accountable. And there is a two-way dialogue happening every single day on That's social true. media yeah. um, that actually determines whether the work we're doing is valid and credible or not. Um, and that is, you hold a tremendous amount of power. Um, you hold us accountable. So I think that is that's something that the people have have actually changed journalism. It mm -hmm. hasn't been the other way around, um, and I've seen it happen so quickly. Even in the last five years, the way we work is so different, and we are we are constantly listening. We do a lot of social listening to make sure that what we're doing is resonating. And if we are wrong, and if we are biased, we are going to get called out. And um, I think that transparency is so important, and it's really made us all, I think, better journalists. Mm -hmm. And, and the reality is that institutions cannot thrive if they're not being representative of the actual population. Totally. So I think it's so important. And I actually heard a quote on the way over here. I was listening to DeRay's podcast. Um, DeRay McKesson has a podcast called Pod Save the People. And um, he, was in, he was interviewing Brene Brown, and she said, um, she quoted Beyonce. Okay. <laughs> so I know it's a lot. It's a lot. It's good. But um, did you follow me there? Okay. And and I'm gonna I'm gonna look at my phone. She said um, she said I worked. Beyonce said I worked really hard to get to a point where I can do what is right and not necessarily what is popular. Mm. Isn't that so good? <laughs> I feel like as a culture, that's where we are now. Yeah. And now, if you have a platform, which maybe is just your Twitter platform. We have a responsibility to do what is right and not what is just popular. And so um, hopefully that inspires someone. It inspired me today. <laughs> and I think that's really been my mantra for throughout my career at Teen Vogue and, and beyond. It's looking for the spaces that need to be filled. It's looking for the white spaces. It's looking for um, the counter narrative. It's looking for um, opportunities to make a difference and, and to make a positive impact and not just following the, not just following the trend. That's amazing. Everyone, round of applause for Elaine Welfrock. <laughs> Thank you.